fish may not be a major part of people's nutrition here, but it certainly is in, in other parts of the world. And the theme of this talk is, uh, is fishing for nutrition, uh, thinking of fish as part of a food system rather than the way that we often think of it, which is as part of a environment, as either an environmental conservation challenge or a trade and financial good. Uh, which is, if you read the fisheries policy literature, that's how it's usually portrayed, despite the fact that most of what we do with fish eventually is eat them. Um, we're at a slightly different position, I think, in fisheries to other parts of food production. So agriculture, I think when you talk about sustainable or conservation agriculture, there is a, a very clear acknowledgement of the social and economic dimensions of sustainability. But if you look at the sort of premier instrument for thinking about fisheries sustainability, the Marine Stewardship Council's uh, fishery standard, its operational principles and standard standardization procedure is purely focused on ecological sustainability. And so there's been a real gap in thinking about um, fish in this broader social and economic context. Um, which brings me to the question of, well, what could we be managing fisheries for? And you could po paddle the policy canoe of fisheries in, in various directions, not very far in that swamp, but um, <laughs> you could manage fisheries for biodiversity conservation. You could manage them to maximize revenues um, or to maximize the, the supply of cheap fish or even to maximize employment in the sector. You might want to keep a large number of people um, employed in some way from fishing. And you can simply decide that, well, fisheries are not important enough to manage, minimize your management costs by allowing fisher folk to do what they do and whatever happens to fish, to fish stocks is, is kind of collateral damage. Um, you'll see that those are pointing in different directions, which implies that there are some trade-offs for them. And more formally, some of you will recognize this as um, a surplus production model. So if the blue line is a cost curve, the, the more fishing effort you have, the more sunk costs or capital that you have in fisheries. Um, and then the yield curve is the yellow one. So you catch more with a certain level of fishing effort, and at that point, uh, the harder you fish, the less fish you catch because you've overexploited the capacity of the resource to generate um, you know, the next generation of fish. And m more formally, that is the well-known Gordon Schaefer surplus production model, which is the kind of model that underlies a lot of fisheries thinking, although it's regarded as a sort of gross oversimplification. So those of you who studied natural resource management as undergraduates, um, and, or those of you who teach it as undergraduates, probably sort of show this model at some at some point, or a similar equivalent for other natural resources. And you know, the thing to take away from this is that you have potential target reference points for management that uh, prioritize the different objectives. So if you're interested in conservation, you would manage to keep fishing effort very low at the expense of giving up a lot of potential catch. And so a, um, a conservation first strategy would keep fishing low, but would result in low yield. Um, and then you have a maximum sustainable yield, which is the quantity that we often think of, the maximum amount of fish that you could take from a resource on a sustainable basis. But if you look at the relationship between maximum sustainable yield and cost, the cost curve, you find that there are very marginal gains uh, to be made from the extra investment in catching the difference between a point that's known as maximum economic yield and maximum sustainable yield. So most policies these days are trying to get fisheries uh, towards a maximum economic yield. So how can you make the most money in the form of resource rents, taxes, license fees, um, the value of fishery quota, um, plus business profits, um, versus you know, maximizing the catch? And if you look at the policies that uh, are in place globally at the moment, uh, the legal regime of fishery management is largely defined by that point of maximum sustainable yield. 
So the proper utilization of economic exclusion zones, um, the conditions under which people can access uh, other economic exclusion zones are defined legally by where a fishery is relative to this notion of maximum sustainable yield. The dominant fishery policy discourse globally is that of um, shifting fisheries from where they're perceived to be at the moment, which is either at or beyond maximum sustainable yield, so overexploited with that sort of dip in production that we saw uh, in the surplus production um, curve, in trying to get them the right side of that, that maximum so that we're getting the most revenue from fisheries, the most value. And people have estimated, there was a study called the Sunken Billions, uh, that estimated $55 billion more value could be created if we managed global fisheries at this maximum economic yield point instead of allowing business as usual, um, this combination of fully exploited and overexploited fisheries that we tend to have at the moment. And so the target, the implicit sort of development target there is about maximizing wealth and also limiting the loss of biodiversity because the less fishing effort we have, the closer um, to the right-hand side of the curve there, sorry, your left-hand side, um, the, the, the more uh, biomass is conserved and the closer aligned we are to conservation objectives. But there is an alternative policy discourse and this one is less powerful but, uh, and it tends to come from small-scale fisheries in developing countries, which is where the majority of the world's fisher folk live and work. And this is about securing livelihoods community cultural values, it's about equity, and most recently it's become about food security and nutrition, which surprisingly was absent from this, a lot of the policy discussions about fisheries for a long time. And so this is about maintaining fisheries in what we would regard as an economically overexploited state, because it allows a large number of people with limited capital access to a means of livelihood or a, a means of sustaining themselves nutritionally. Um, so you can see that with the trade-offs between these policy objectives, a move from the open access equilibrium by strengthening property rights so that you've got maximum economic yield implies a trade-off of excluding large numbers of people who currently benefit, albeit suboptimally on a, on a global s sense, um, from fisheries. So those the, that's the sort of policy arena. And what I want to do is to try to reframe fisheries as part of the food system. And it's surprising in a way that this needs to be, needs to be done, but as I mentioned at the start, this is not currently just not the way that people tend to think of fisheries. If you look at the food security literature, fisheries is often left out. If you look at the fisheries literature, until about three or four years ago, people were talking exclusively about um, you know, the tensions between um, maintaining access for a wide group of, of small-scale fishers and maximizing trade revenues and conserving fish stocks. So the largest or most influential uh, body of, of, of people working on fisheries talk about over-harvesting, overfishing, and the need to conserve stocks. It's never been until more recently clear what the deeper societal purpose of conserving stocks is. It's not that fisheries policy has rarely been explicit about broader social goals. It's been a very sectoral policy. Uh, discourse. So what I want to look at today is how do fisheries and aquaculture contribute to nutrition and food security? Why should we be thinking of fish in a food, in a food studies context? Um, what threatens that contribution? What can be done to sustain it in the light of, the, of these threats? And how, can how then could we govern fisheries and aquaculture with food security and nutrition as our sort of central objectives? What would a, what would a fisheries sector governed for those um, purposes look like? How would, how would it be different to the way that we govern fisheries at the moment? The impetus for rethinking fisheries in the context of food security came largely as a result of the food, price, uh, the food crisis of 2007-8, um, when we had a huge spike in food prices and a billion people who had been um, pulled out of hunger in the, in the preceding decades, sort of plunged back into a, a state of nutrition insecurity. And a series of sort of global studies came out at that time, um, also focused not just on present insecurity, but on 
meeting targets uh, for food security in uh, the year 2050 in this case, where there's going to be an estimated 9 billion people uh, as opposed to the sort of 7 billion people that we have uh, today. And in that large study, uh, fisheries got a mention. So overexploitation of fisheries is seen as a problem in our ability to produce uh, sufficient food, requiring urgent um, attention if we're to try to both reduce the impact of food production on our environment, uh, conserving environmental functions, and also to supply the anticipated increasing nutrition demands of this growing uh, population and also a population that is eating ever more animal source foods. So the contribution of fish is not so much to calories, um, but to nutrition in the form of micronutrients. And so the, the, the major food security discussions around fisheries have been largely in broad food security terms before. But as we learn more about the role of fish um, in people's diets, uh, the focus has turned more to nutrition security um, and fish as a micronutrient, rich food crucial to preventing disease and ensuring appropriate child development, um, as well as a means to prevent future diet-related diseases. So the relationship between fisheries and food security is rather complex because it's not as straightforward through consumption. Uh, consumption is important. Um, one-sixth of, it provides um, more than one-sixth of animal protein for uh, more than half the world's uh, population. And it's an important but unquantified largely as source of micronutrients. It's also an important provider of household income for um, half a billion people or more. And it's one of the world's most traded food commodities with exports uh, worth 130 billion or so dollars per year. Um, so economic growth is also a, a means by which people gain food security through and uh, as is employment. So it's not just the consumption of fish, but the indirect economic benefits that fish sale and trade and fish jobs bring to food security, enabling people to afford medical care uh, and other foods as well as, as meeting their staple food needs and so on. So when we think about fish and food security, we're not just thinking about availability in, in consumption, but we're also looking at uh, being able to access foods indirectly through the market um, that, that comes from the sale of fish and the trade of fish. And so the trade-offs between selling a fish and eating it are not as straightforward in food security terms as they're sometimes portrayed in the, the sort of evolving literature around fisheries and food security. Um, on the face of it, you know, we hear a lot about fisheries crisis, but on the face of it, if you aggregate sufficiently, i.e. at global level, um, the supply of fish, the food supply, which is the, uh, the top blue line there, is increasing faster than population growth. So per capita supply of fish is actually at a global all-time high, um, about 20 kilograms per person per year. And the growth of fish for food, the, the purple uh, bars there, uh, is increasing. And the sort of non-food uses, which is largely fish meal, is actually slight level or slightly decreasing uh, during this period. So we're not converting as much fish uh, to animal feed as we did back in the 1990s, um, a higher proportion of it's going towards um, human consumption. The reason that we're getting so much more fish per capita on a global basis is the growth of aquaculture. So that's aggregate growth rates of various food sectors um, from the period 1990 to 2009. And you'll see that the fastest growing of those sections of the, of the uh, food system uh, has been aquaculture, with an average annual growth rate of uh, around 8% per year, uh, which is really fast, faster than you know, the poultry industry has been growing very fast. Um, but, and, and that's faster than global population growth, hence the increase in per capita supply. In the meantime, capture fisheries has pretty much leveled off since the 1990s. So we're, we're pretty much at, at the limits of what we can produce in capture fisheries, but aquaculture continues to grow. Um, and if you look at fish, capture fisheries and aquaculture in comparison to other 
uh, sources of uh, animal, animal source foods. Fish as a, as a sort of dietary component is comparable in size to the global chicken industry and it's bigger than the beef industry. And that's quite surprising because it's still often left out of thinking about and planning for food security. Now, a lot of this um, increased production of fish isn't going to feed poor people. Uh, it's, a lot of it is globally traded, as I mentioned before. And if you look at where, so a lot of that aquaculture production growth is in Asia. And if you look at where um, Asia is sending a large proportion of its, its fish, it's, it's to places like North America. So this is a map of where North America, where we get our fish from. Um, and we get half of the fish that's consumed in the North American, North and Central American continent comes from Asia, and a lot of that is uh, farmed shrimp, um, basa, I think it's called here, it's a sort of Mekong catfish, uh, tilapia, and other products like that. And, you know, so a lot of this growth sustains the consumption of fish in wealthier countries. It's not necessarily consumed by the poor. So if you look at where people actually depend on fish globally um, for their diets, where fish in this case is, uh, makes up a high proportion of the total consumption of animal protein, there's a band of countries in uh, South and Southeast Asia and East Asia, the sort of archipelago nations, um, up in the high Arctic, Iceland and Greenland, and perhaps more surprisingly to people, a band of countries across Central, uh, East and West Africa. And the total quantity of fish that people eat in Africa may be lower than the, the quantity that we eat here even, but proportionally it's a much larger com constituent of their diets because people in Africa eat per capita less of everything um, and certainly less protein. So those are the areas where fish is a, is a major part of people's diets. Um, so what are the health risks and the benefits then of, of fish consumption that um, provide an incentive to think about fisheries in, in a nutrition context? Well, the first thing I want to say is that it isn't about protein. Um, people are eating more protein than they need, especially in the wealthy countries. So this green area is uh, the protein that we get from vegetables and we need about 50 grams of protein per day to maintain growth metabolism in a healthy way. And you'll see that at the moment, all parts of the world on average get more protein, at least as much, and in many cases, much more protein than they need. And if we look at, at our diets, the US, European Union, developed countries, um, first thing to note is that we get a lower proportion of our diet from vegetable sources than, or than any other people on the planet. And we're getting a lot more protein than we need. And a lot of that is from animal source foods. And so the idea that fish, and you'll see this in a ton of fisheries papers, fish is a vital source of protein. Uh, no, it isn't. Because none of us need more protein than we're getting. Um, Maybe one or two bodybuilders out there do need a bit more protein, but uh, by and large, we, we all consume too much protein. And my son, who's a medical student, I've managed to persuade him to throw away the large tub of you know, protein supplements that uh, every teenage boy these days has in their, in their sort of cupboard at home, um, because you actually you know, metabolically don't need that much protein. Um, so if it's not about protein, what is it about? Well, first of all, it does f the consumption of fish has been proven through a series of sort of meta-analysis um, health cohort studies that a consumption of 60 grams of fish per day is associated with a, with a reduction in mortality. And diets low in seafood uh, omega-3 fatty acids accounted for 1.4 million deaths in 2010, according to a large... Um, global meta-analysis. 
and 1% of the world's total burden of disease-related disability-adjusted life years, which is a way that people measure sort of death and um, lower, quali lower health quality uh, in a standardized way. And there's a sort of series of, of studies published in very reputable medical journals that show that. Um, so what is it in fish that's contributing to those health costs if you're not getting enough and health benefits if you are? Omega-3s is the big one that we all talk about. And um, Danny Mozafarian and, and, and Rim there published a study that showed omega-3 rich fish um, can reduce the risks of heart disease um, by a third if consumed two to three times a week. Um, so that's a really big significant um, positive effect on, on heart disease, which is one of the, the kind of major contributors to morbidity and mortality uh, in developed countries and increasingly in transitional and developing countries as well. And different fish have got different amounts of omega-3 in, and I picked this um, slightly fuzzy slide because it doesn't come from the West. It comes from, uh, from Indonesia, where people are now getting health advice on you know, which fish to consume because of their rich omega-3. And so it's Atlantic sam farmed Atlantic salmon that they're importing from Norway. Um, I used to live in Penang, and Penang fishhead curry now has Norwegian salmon heads floating around in it, which is a bit of a surprise to encounter when you lift the lid of your uh, Penang fishhead curry pot. Um, but a lot of small oily fish, sardines, etc. And we'll come back to the importance of those small oily fish in this discussion about nutrition-based fisheries. Uh, but some of the sort of things that we enjoy eating, grouper and snapper and, and catfish and Pacific cod, um, are pretty low in omega-3s, so they're not necessarily beneficial in that sense. They're good sources of lean animal protein, not bad for you, um, but you know, they don't uh, have that, that sort of rich omega-3 content that the oilier, fishier fish have. And many of us have got a sort of cultural preference for less oily fish. So we're not necessarily getting the healthiest fish. Um, there are also sort of scares about consuming fish, and the oilier the fish, sometimes the, the higher concentration of mercury in it, and it's to do with sort of food chain effects as well. And you hear a lot of anxiety about fish consumption, um, particularly during pregnancy, because of the, the, the high mercury content. Again, some of this, when you look deeper into it, is um, needless in terms of, of a scare, because most nutritionists these days argue that the risks from um, consuming, the mercury risks of consuming fish are outweighed by the health benefits to both mother and fetus um, and you know, breastfed child of the omega-3s that, that enable that child's development. And if you look at the mercury toxicity question, you also have to consider um, selenium content. Now, selenium is also an essential micronutrient, but it is also toxic in too high concentrations. But the toxicity of mercury is dependent on the selenium-mercury ratio, because selenium um, counteracts mercury toxicity. And so if you want to understand mercury toxicity, you have to also look at selenium. So um, where the ratio is one to one or better, mercury toxicity is not an issue. So you shouldn't eat pilot whales or mako sharks, <laughs> um, but it's okay to eat yellowfin tuna and albacore and, and things like that um, because the quantity of selenium deals with any mercury toxicity. Okay, so um, omega-3s are important to developed country populations, but in developing countries, there are also other micronutrients that uh, we probably get enough of in, in developed countries, but people w living in nutritionally poor situations might need. Um, so I want to talk about small fish as a, a rich source of multiple essential micronutrients um, for a few minutes. And this is all work from nutrition surveys done in Bangladesh and Cambodia by a former colleague of mine at the World Fish Center, uh, Shakuntala Thielsted and a series of publications over the last uh, decade or two. And some of those small indigenous fish can be really, really rich sources of things like iron. Um, there's a large 
proportion of the world's population are uh, iron deficient. Iron deficiency cause, causes anemia, and um, anemia is particularly prevalent in undernourished um, expectant mothers. And so ensuring an adequate source of iron during pregnancy and, and, and lactation is you know, a vital sort of nutrition need. And it turns out that all these things with the long Latin names are those small fish that we just saw a picture of, that they have very high quantities of iron um, comparable to the things that are normally recommended as part of an iron rich diet. And if you can't get hold of chicken, um, then fish is an excellent alternative. Similarly with vitamin A, um, vitamin A deficiency is, is again a major uh, contributor to uh, morbi morbidity and, and mortality. Um, I think around 20 million deaths a year are uh, linked to vitamin A deficiency globally. And chicken liver is the champion source of vitamin A among sort of commonly consumed uh, sources, but the fish with the long Latin names are, are next and better than carrots and, and even the mighty kale. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a catch in that the nutrition value of the fish depends on which species you, you choose in terms of omega-3s and also in terms of micronutrient contents, but it also depends on what parts you eat and how you cook it. Um, so thinking of the parts, if you take one of these, sm these small uh, fish, and it's, it's about kind of that long, um, half the vitamin A content is in the eye. And the next largest fraction is in the viscera, the guts. And if you think about what we mostly do with fish here, we eviscerate them and we cut off the head and, and then fillet them. And we're throwing away most of the nutrition value in that context. And that's fine for us because most of us get enough vitamin A from all the other sources. If you have a diverse diet, by and large, you're getting enough um, vitamins, nutrients, micro, uh, minerals. But uh, for people who have you know, a rice-based diet, and this is a sort of major accompaniment to, to that, uh, it's really important that they have access to the nutrients in the whole fish. So having access to small fish eaten whole is really important. And in Bangladesh, uh, in rural Bangladesh, people get 40% of their calcium from eating the bones and scales of small fish. Um, if you don't come from a culture where you, where you eat milk products, um, you're not getting much calcium from those sources. There are calcium-rich vegetables, but again, you know, getting enough of those uh, can be expensive. So these are a, a great source of calcium as well. So we're actually trying to study the uh, global health consequences of changes in fish supply now uh, using micronutrients and not protein like everyone else has done. And so we've got this project, uh, two projects actually, one the Socioeconomic Synthesis Center, uh, National Science Foundation, and a, a foundation called the Wellcome Trust. And this project has sort of started with an analysis of climate change and fishery governance regimes, their effects on abundance and catch of fish. Um, we've got a supply demand model uh, developed by a colleague of mine at World Fish originally that links catch to consumption. And then we have a series of databases. Um, we've got this thing called Genus Database, which is a global nutrition um, database. And we've got uh, household um, income and expenditure survey studies that also monitor people's health outcomes. So we've got a sort of end-to-end -end model here where we're trying to uh, get a sense of um, what a change in availability of fish will mean for the number of people in the world who are getting adequate um, supplies of micronutrients. And as you can Imagine this is you know, a, a large scale sort of analysis of this on a global scale is going to have to make a number of simplifying assumptions, so the figures are very rough. Uh, but we have published a, a preliminary um, analysis of this data already in a, in a, in a sort of short commentary in, in Nature. And the preliminary results are well, if 30% of the global population is vitamin A deficient, 
17% is zinc deficient and 20% and of pregnant women have iron deficiency anemia. Uh, in that context, and thinking about fish as a source of these nutrients only, um, we're projecting that by 2050, under climate change, under you know, projections about the future of fisheries governance and the future growth of aquaculture, the decrease in supply to the people that are nutritionally vulnerable mean that an additional 845 million people will become deficient in at least one of these nutrients uh, by 2050. Okay, that's obviously a lot of if this and if that, but it still gives you a sense of the, of the sort of uh, nutrition importance of making sure that the people who need it um, continue to get a supply of fish. And just to sort of highlight where that, that is an issue, um, we looked at the countries where there was nutritional vulnerability and high fish consumption. And the areas that sort of stand out are the ones where people are highly fish dependent um, that are poorer countries. So, you know, we had Iceland being highly fish dependent, but the Icelandic diet is, uh, you know, people are getting enough access to fish there and will be able to buy alternatives or they'll be able to buy fish at higher prices, they'll be able to afford it. Uh, but in poorer countries, where nutritional deficits are deeper and uh, alternative food sources either more expensive or not as available, um, we could see these, these malnutrition uh, problems if there's a major decrease in fish supplies. Um, so I've briefly talked about climate change and overfishing, but what is it that threatens fish production and uh, what is being done about it? Well, you do hear all these things about oceans being in crisis. Um, only 1% of the sea is protected. Um, and, you know, the benefits that, the, that conservation in the oceans could bring. And it does highlight some of the, the, the food ones. And so that makes a case for ocean conservation in order to uh, preserve the conditions under which you can continue to produce nutritious fish. But there are also these discourses about you know, the parlous state of, of fish um, populations, wild fish in particular. And this analysis sort of captured headlines and still continues to, to be a sort of reference point for many people in terms of our trajectory, where we're heading in fisheries. And this was um, looking at the number of taxa in the sea that have collapsed um, due to fishing over the last 30 to 40 years and an extrapolation forward if those rates of collapse continue, then by 2048, all fisheries will be commercially extinct. Now, this is one of these kind of extrapolations that you have to be extremely careful of, and there's since been several refutations, but certainly this has been very influential in shaping the discussion and the need for a sort of more conservation-focused fisheries, which means that the supply of wild capture fish, it will decrease if this narrative remains influential. And we're really making a choice of saying, we need to be cautious and conserve the seas. Um, and you know, that will have consequences for nutrition that, that we need to evaluate. Um, so it's important to get that picture right. And there have been a number of counter analyses that show that the picture is not as bleak as that extrapolation portrayed. Because it does assume that you know, as fish stocks collapse, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and ignore um, ignore that and not do anything about it. Whereas, you know, in fact, at, at some point we have largely taken measures and there have been a number of successes with fishery management that you don't hear about so much. I think, you know, still when I go to talks or, um, you know, listen to um, graduate classes on fisheries, that the messages that my students have, have certainly got in, in previous um, lectures is that fisheries are all collapsing. But we do have a number of, of recoveries and success stories in world fisheries. Uh, the European Union, which you know, many people thought was a disaster fisheries management-wise, uh, a number of major fish stocks there have recovered. These are spawning stock biomasses. Um, the green line is the um, range under which there is concern for the sustainability of the, of the stocks because the spawning stock is too low to sustain their required um, regeneration. A number of those have seen large upticks in the last few years. And that's been to, due to better fisheries management. And now there are a number of these sort of major fish stocks 
are in, in healthy condition. And that's reflected globally where fisheries governance reforms are working in terms of conserving and rebuilding fish stocks at least. Uh, they often haven't had much social and economic monitoring. But these symbols represent uh, predominant governance regimes in each region for which they, there are claims of success out there in the literature from people who've studied them. Um, and these are, these are different sort of means, marine protected areas, territorial use rights, cat shares, co-management, different sort of models of fishery governance. Now the fisheries world spend an awful lot of time arguing about which one of these is best and most economists sort of favour cat shares and individual transferable quotas as the strongest sort of semi-quasi-private property right um, to access and, and, um, and land fish. But in fact, you know, all of them work if used well in the right places. Uh, so the argument really needs to, to be about, well, how do, you, how do you roll out more success like this rather than, you know, exactly which instrument should be, is the best. But we undoubtedly do have continuing problems. And this is a, an analysis of fish supply and demand in uh, the Western Pacific. And the countries in red here are ones where coastal fisheries, which are where people are getting their fish, will not supply the fish needed um, to, for food security, for nutrition security, uh, by the year 2030. And this was you know, published only a few years ago. And then there's some of concern and then others where, um, you know, the coastal fisheries will meet forecast needs for fish in the future, looking at demand and population increase. And these islands are not that well linked into global fish trade networks, so they're largely reliant on their own production. Um, the sort of complication in this story is that a lot of these countries support massive tuna fisheries, but all those tuna are being exported and we're eating them. Um, and one of the policy measures that uh, Johan Bell and, and others have been talking about is how do you get some of that tuna landed domestically to meet the shortfall in reef fish that's expected? And um, talking to Rebecca earlier, I mean, there is also the sort of cultural uh, hurdle of people prefer reef fish. And uh, tuna is, is, is kind of less accessible, accessible through different value chains. Um, and also, how do you get industrial companies to land fish domestically at a loss when they could be selling it into world markets for, for you know, higher profits? So there's a number of sort of policy questions open around how do you, how do you implement a, um, a measure that could deal with this in theory, but uh, requires a number of sort of changes to markets and human behavior uh, to implement in practice. So is aquaculture the answer to meeting increased demand and improving marine conservation? And people are increasingly talking about a sustainability transition in aquaculture from this sort of polluting purveyor of, of luxury seafood from the rich that it used to be sort of thought of as you know, a sustainable way of getting high quality, nutritious food at low environmental cost to the poor. And environmentally, aquaculture looks pretty good. Um, the carbon footprint, and this is, I recognize, only one dimension of environmental performance of aquaculture compared to wild fish and other animal source foods shows that most aquaculture systems, even uh, Atlantic salmon, uh, which is illustrated in this picture, are of comparable or lower environmental impact than, say, poultry production, and certainly a lot better than uh, feedlot beef or, or uh, lamb and mutton production. Um, of course, there are other issues. There are antibiotics. There's, there's kind of mangrove deforestation. There's a whole range of other environmental issues. Uh, but those from public pressure are, are coming under control somewhat. And they're certainly, in most cases, no worse than what's happening in the rest of animal agriculture. And aquaculture also has advantages in terms of water use, land use, obviously. Um, and you know, overall looks like an environmentally more benign way of, of producing animal source foods uh, than many other alternatives. When you look at where that uh, environmental cost is, it's largely in the feed. Um, 90 per, 90, over 90% of, of global warming potential in both salmon and tilapia comes from the feed supply. And it's the fuel that's needed to catch and convert that feed 
This is from life cycle analysis, which we're, we're doing um, a number of these kinds of studies. We're doing oyster farming in the Pacific at the moment. That's looking really good um, because you don't have to do very much to an oyster. You don't even have to feed it. It just kind of sits there, <laughs> filter feeds, and you just carry it in. The main, um, the main sort of carbon cost is, is you know, electricity is for pumps and purification and holding facilities and, and transportation, all of which is low. So what are future fish farms going to look like? Um, you know, some of the, the sort of evolving frontiers are land-based aquaculture. These are salmon tanks, um, recirculating systems that are highly efficient, but that, you know, there may be consumer resistance against you know, battery salmon farming, if you like. Uh, and offshore fish cages is, is another thing that people are proposing, which requires a shift in the sort of the way that we govern uh, coastal waters. And, this permitting processes in the US have taken a long time to permit the development of these large offshore fish cages. Uh, but there's a couple now gone through. I think Massachusetts uh, has licensed offshore mussel farming. And I think uh, off San Diego, there's a few of these experimental uh, fish cages. But by and large, our permitting system doesn't allow uh, the development of this technology here. And it's expensive, um, and we may not see it globally um, for some time yet, uh, which leaves our coastal waters. And this is what uh, parts of the coast of China look like, and Korea, and Vietnam, um, covered in seaweed farms. These are all... So this is, this is you know, a growth potential area that we could get more food from the sea. We currently get, I think it's 2% of our food calorifically um, from the sea. Um, and it's 71% of the, the Earth's surface, so that many people are seeing the sea as the sort of agricultural frontier. But it would require a transformation of our seascapes. Um, and coastal zones, of course, are under pressure from all kinds of other uses. And this is in Taranto, Italy. That's the Europe's largest steel plant. And there's been a traditional mussel farming industry, which is in the foreground there. And, you know, this illustrates the increasing conflicts we have in coastal zones between food production and other uses. So we're now seeing the coast being used for uh, power generation, pollutant disposal, uh, industrialization, recreation, um, amenity values of various kinds. In the US, many people with coastal property resist aquaculture development. Nobody wants a mussel farm in front of their expensive coastal um, property. And so these kinds of things are limiting the, gr the growth potential in the areas where fish farming as a low environmental cost um, food production system, they're presenting, they're, they're, they will prevent its growth in the future. So the sites available for aquaculture are relatively limited unless you either go offshore or into recirculating systems, which both have their sort of current capacity limitations. And this is likely to put a break on aquaculture production um, in the near future. You also have a set of sort of social and ethical concerns around um, sustainable both fisheries and aquaculture. You probably heard about um, the use of slave labor in Thai shrimp value chains. And this was slave labor on the boats that were catching the feed to feed to shrimp in shrimp farms. And that, the shrimp from those farms was being exported um, to, to the US in Costco and Safeway and various other um, major retailers. And so this is now being addressed by trying to bring social um, criteria into sustainable seafood certification. So right at the beginning, I showed you a slide from the Marine Conservation, the Marine Stewardship Council that had only ecological criteria. Well, now people like Monterey Bay Aquarium um, and others are working on bringing social criteria um, into sustainable seafood certification. So these are the attempts to sort of move fisheries and aquaculture to sustainability um, and as a means of, you know, continuing this contribution to the food system. But there's more that we could do simply by refocusing the aims of fisheries and aquaculture away from simply increasing production. And those impressive production stats I showed at the beginning on aquaculture you know, 
production does not equal nutrition security. It doesn't even equal food security. It's a mistake that we've been sort of uh, pursuing that we think if we produce more food, there will be no more hunger. Well, we have a surplus globally of calories. We don't need to produce more food. We just need to produce more of the right kind of food and we need to distribute it a lot better or distribute the means to access that food more effectively. And uh, we also need to reduce waste. So those are the kind of overall large-scale policy directions that need to be considered. But within fisheries and aquaculture, um, you know, one of the key things that we, we need to do is to better integrate fisheries into food systems. And one of the ways we're doing that is, is to talk about integrating fisheries and agri um, agricultural programs. And we're talking increasingly about something called nutrition sensitive fisheries and aquaculture, following from, I don't know if some of you have heard the discussion in agriculture about a move towards a nutrition sensitive agriculture, of thinking about shifting agriculture away from its uh, fixation with producing you know, large quantities of um, energy-dense staples, some of which are fed to cattle um, to make protein that we don't really need because we're eating too much protein, or you know, are consumed as, as staple grains that we're all consuming too much of, fueling a, a sort of global obesity epidemic. So you know, the purpose of agriculture, um, this discourse about nutrition-sensitive agriculture, is to shift the agricultural sector from a sort of production and profit mindset to a meeting human nutrition needs um, orientation. So we're trying to do the same in fisheries and, and aquaculture. And you know, one of the uh, concerns of the sector is that uh, all this aquaculture production is, is leading, is, is productionist in orientation, and it may not be providing the same kinds of nutrients that wild fish does. And so if you look at um, vitamin A and vitamin B12 content in small indigenous wild fish here in Bangladesh and common aquaculture species, for most of them, there's a stark difference. So the small indigenous wild fish that are eaten whole are much more nutritious than the carps and tilapias and, um, and catfish, Mekong catfish, that are being farmed and eaten in filleted form. So the transition from wild fish to, cap to aquaculture caught fish may mean nutritional impoverishment. Okay, so a fish is not a fish. It depends how it was produced, which bit were eaten, um, what type of fish it was, et cetera, et cetera. And that's an idea that we're sort of trying to bring into the discussion about, you know, uh, getting sufficient fish into people's diets. It, it matters what kind of fish and how it was produced. You do, of course, have the possibility in aquaculture through manipulating the feed to design the nutrient signature of what you're farming. And again, that requires a sort of consumer preference and awareness among the, the farming community and the consumer population of the need to do this. And so again, that's a sort of message that's uh, only just beginning. The other major sort of impediment is that all of our fishing system, and I'll explain this graph in a minute, all of our fishing system is largely based around conserving and sustaining fisheries by catching only a limited quantity of the larger fish in a system. And so some fishery scientists have started to challenge this recently, and this is one such analysis um, that argues that instead of just catching a sustainable fraction of the larger fish, we could s catch a sustainable fraction of the whole food chain. And they're saying that this would be more efficient, would produce more fish, and would be better for biodiversity conservation because it wouldn't take large chunks out of the ecosystem. It would take um, production in proportion to the productivity of different size classes of fish out at the same rate. So you would leave the ecosystem unaltered and you would just be taking off some surplus production from all size classes. And so this has been done theoretically. It's in practice what tends to happen in unregulated fisheries because people catch all sizes of fish. Um, so unselective fishing here, if you look at the dotted and the, the, the black lines, first of all, um, the dotted line is balanced harvest, so catching fish of all size classes. And the other one is, is um, the, so the solid line there is the um, selective harvesting. And you'll see that you can, hi you can get a, a bit more yield out of the balanced harvest, but uh, under some scenarios, it's, um, 
it's more precarious. If you allow fishing intensity to increase, you'll get a, a more rapid collapse in production than uh, if, you're, if you're more selective in your harvest. So many people say, well, this is a license to, to sort of uh, allow more dangerous overfishing. So there's a lot of concerns about it. But from a nutrition point of view, catching more of the small fish uh, allows you access to more nutrition. So if you're thinking about maximum nutrition yield, balanced harvest might be an interesting um, way to go. And it would also culturally mean us eating fish that we're not used to eating. And so there's the question of, is there a market for all these sort of small oily fish? And, you know, there's an increasing movement among chefs to have trash fish dinners. I went to one, a trash fish sushi dinner a few weeks ago, um, where we got, you know, sushi and sashimi made from all sorts of bits of leftover fish and all kinds of fish that you didn't think that people ate, like blue runners, which are used as bait in Florida. Um, turns out they make good sashimi as well. Um, so, you know, broadening people's tastes, uh, shifting the way that people eat to reduce protein as a sort of central part of the plate. These all play a part in sort of developing a, a sustainable nutrition focused agriculture and aquaculture and fisheries. So just to conclude then, um, what would fisheries and aquaculture governed for food and nutrition security look like? How would it be different to what we do now? Well, we'd, I think we'd be catching and eating more small nutrient-dense fish that here in the US we just call forage fish. They feed for bigger fish, but you know, they're good food. Uh, we would probably conserve more big fish because in many cases they're worth more alive than dead um, in various sort of tourism-related businesses. We would orientate aquaculture to produce nutrient-rich fish and shellfish at low environmental impact. That means you know, feeding things differently um, growing different kinds of fish, not sort of growing just, you know, big salmon and other predatory fish. Um, we would support access regimes and value chains for local, global, regional markets. I didn't really talk about that, but, you know, that's a way of, of sort of getting fish directly to people instead of siphoning them away through global markets and hoping that the money comes back somehow to those people and gets spent on healthcare and good food, which often those linkages don't work too well. Um, we would reverse our current policy emphasis. If you look at fisheries development these days, aquaculture development, it's all about getting fish into global value chains to maximize uh, value. And so our policy effectively emphasizes how do we get more of the world's fish into, onto the plates of wealthy consumers? And nutritionally, that's not where it needs to be. Um, so we might, the utility function that we, we might seek to maximize through fisheries management is not rent or revenue or jobs, but it might be human health, which requires us to calculate different things in fisheries. Um, reducing the loss of disability adjusted life years due to dietary factors, which means we, we need to know a lot more about the role of fish in diets, nutrient content and so on. And we're building the databases to allow us to make these kinds of estimations right now. And the target that we're suggesting is maybe managing for maximum nutrition yield, uh, which is a target that doesn't currently exist. And um, sort of my overall policy vision is, is this one, making fish available for all who need it for a healthy life and producing and distributing it in uh, ways that respect environmental limits uh, economic and health needs and you know also uh, contribute to our aspirations and cultural values because for many people eating fish is more about than, than just about uh, nutrition um, to a Bangladeshi it's it's literally what you're made of uh, if you are what you eat Bangladeshis are made of rice and fish thank you And sorry, because I didn't re rehearse and ad-libbed a lot, I've taken way more time than I thought. Um, I don't know if we've got time for questions. Thank you, that was really great to talk about something. Um, my name is Jacob. I'm, uh, my first chapter of my dissertation is around small scale fisheries and canarian fisheries. So it's really interesting to me. Um, so I'm trying to look for uh, challenging questions that kind of make me think about that more. And so 
in your like in the Gordon Schaefer model and in maximum sustainable yield versus maximum economic yield in general, we're managing supply. We're responding to um, we're constraining or regulating uh, demand. Whereas a maximum nutritional yield, you're you're trying to affect demand, right? And so you said that um, if we're maximizing utility functions, but but managers don't maximize utility functions; consumers do. So so how are you affecting the demand side? If what I mean, just theoretically, what's a maximum nutritional yield model look like if it's a demand side model? Mm -hmm. I think it would come from an awareness of, you know, what your needs are, and uh, a sort of part of res yeah, or in supply networks, and part of this trying to direct fish towards um, at least a proportion of the of the increased fish production that we're seeing towards uh, consumers that need it, and this might require sort of, you know, public policy intervention, and I know that in a in a sort of market-driven economy, the idea of public policy directing an economic activity is almost heretical. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we have had public policy in the past. Some sovereign states do have governments that, that have policies that, that do take direct markets. Not all of them, but... <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's, it's within the sphere of the possible, I think. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really to, to try to focus the attention of um, catching fish in such a way that, that you allow the market to be supplied with nutritious fish. Uh, that becomes one of your priorities rather than just saying, well, it doesn't matter what fish it is, it's, it's all about what people are willing to pay for it. And we're currently doing an analysis of the relationship between price and, and nutrition content. Now, it's very context-specific because the nutrition value of a fish doesn't matter to a well-nourished consumer, so there's no price premium on nutrition, and there's no extra value to eating a nutritious fish. And there is, if you've got, you know, you're at risk of, of heart disease and you're buying, you're going to eat cheap, oily fish, then it does have a value. It's not reflected in the market at the moment because those fish tend to be cheap um, because people don't like eating them. They'll buy supplements instead, but supplements are not quite the same for reasons that nutritionists uh, tell me, but um, yeah, so I think that there is the possibility just to s sort of shift the thinking. Um, we haven't tied it yet. We're not at the stage of tying it yet to um, the supply demand model that we're using just to look at uh, how fish prices have respond, responded to changes in supply and demand in the past. So we're calculating elasticities based on past data. Um, we haven't yet thought through the implications of, you know, shifts in demand that would take place from a, a, a nutrition-focused uh, policy. That's kind of one of the future things to think about. But yeah, thanks for that idea. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, um, well, a bright spot that fizzled out and a bright spot that looks like it will continue. Um, the bright spot that fizzled out was attempts to get people to eat more Peruvian anchoveta rather than getting it reduced into fish meal. And, you know, what that came up, it came up against um, one, you couldn't make people eat things that were good for them that they didn't want to eat. And two, you couldn't persuade the industry to bear the extra costs of landing these fish for, in a condition fit for human consumption rather than just bunging them in a boat and, and sort of turning them into fish meal and oil, which you don't have to look after them at all. Uh, if you, if you're, you don't have to put them on ice or anything. If you're fishing for fish meal, it doesn't matter if they're sort of putrefied when they, when they come ashore. It's, it's sort of... Well, it does. I mean, putrefied, no. But uh, you don't have to handle them with quite the same care. And handling fish with care costs money, and you have to get that in the form of, of an increased price. And it proved not to be that economic. But it was attempted in Peru. So people are beginning to think about these experiments. Um, and, you know, I think we'll, 
we're starting to see people value a wider range of fish. Trash fish movement's part of that. So I think we're starting to be more nutritionally conscious as well as more environmentally and socially aware in our consumption. And I think the whole seafood movement um, is going that way and even some of the mass market sectors of it. And the other bright spot I think is in aquaculture where there's been real innovation in feeds such that, you know, people are always, and I still see this at talks, people say, wow, it takes seven kilos of fish meal to make a kilo of salmon. Well, that, yes, it did in 1985. Um, not now. The ratio is pretty much one to one uh, because there's been supplementing feeds from other areas. Now, some people have said, well, shifting into using soya feeds and grain feeds, uh, one, it reduces the nutrition value of the, of the salmon and uh, two, it puts extra pressure on terrestrial cropland. It's just like another source of, you know, Amazonian deforestation or whatever. Um, so yes, to an extent, but what's been invented since is, is sort of algal feeds which have omega-3 signatures which seem similar to um, the ones in fish meal. Now people are still studying whether vegetable omega-3s have the same medical benefit as fish source omega-3s. That's an open question in the nutrition world. Uh, it's being claimed, of course, and hence, you know, your omega-3 enriched milk, eggs, etc. Nobody's quite sure whether that conveys the same nutrition benefits as omega-3 from fish, or whatever you see claimed by, um, you know, the food manufacturers. It's not entirely clear that the benefits are the same. Um, it's very, very difficult to study that kind of thing. Um, from, from sort of large cohort studies and things. But um, algal feeds are, you know, the first vegetarian salmon have been produced. I've eaten them. They're, they're kind of okay, a little bit mushy. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that was the growing method rather than the, the, the feed. Um, but yes, we, we have the, te the technological uh, advances in aquaculture feeds allow us the potential to farm much, much more sustainably than we have done in the past. And in a way, it seems to be going the opposite way to a lot of uh, meat production, which, um, the, you know, the sort of environmental requirements of meat production have, have gone the other way. And whereas I think with aquaculture, we're getting better and better at it uh, environmentally as, as time goes on. Yeah. One more quick one, and folks can leave if they need to. Uh, thank you for the talk. Interesting. Uh, so from a standpoint of family who deals with a lot of food allergies and therefore has a very actually limited diet. Um, for someone in this region, I mean in the inland area that doesn't have access to something like wild fish, uh, what do you think would be our best to purchase at the grocery store if we're looking for a, a nutrient rich fish rather than say a protein rich fish? Also taking things like the like you were saying, the mercury selenium balance and all those issues. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know Canned tuna is, is good. Tuna, yeah, anchovies and sardines are great, but some, not everyone likes the, the sort of fishier, stronger fishy taste. Um, black cod, which is you get in the Pacific, has high omega threes and um, it's a little bit fishy as well. Basically, the fishy ones are the ones that are really good for you. Oh, and the other thing is, don't deep fry it because um, deep frying it breaks down the long chain uh, fatty acids. Um, the omega-3s and you basically get the fatty acid signature of the oil that you fry it in and the oils also break down which is why you know if you use olive oil you don't get the benefits of olive oil for frying either because it sort of the long chain fatty acids break up with intense heat and so you just get you know you may as well fry it in uh, yeah in, in canola or something so yeah um, roasting baking um, steaming Fish soups are a good way to, to get all the nutrients from a fish. You can use the whole fish and the heads and things like that and fish stocks and it gets absorbed into the water without actually physically having to sort of... <laughs> Jump on the <laughs> Jump on the <laughs> yeah. That's the most wise part in the <laughs> <laughs> is, is it? Yeah. Probably stems from you know, a, a nutrition need originally. Because I can't... Yeah, maybe it is a, a taste preference, but you know, I'll eat eyeballs because I've read this literature <laughs> and seen the nutrient profiles, but I'm not sure I can claim to enjoy them.